to think about this question of democratizing development, we're going to start with Francisco Ferreira, who's a lead economist in the World Bank's research department. He's also a research fellow at the Institute for the Study of Labor. And he's one of the people who co-directed the writing of the World Development Report of 2006, which was on equity and development. He's written lots of other things and won lots of prizes, but what he's gonna do is start us out thinking about development and inequality. What I wanna do then is to talk a little bit about one aspect of this issue of inclusion. So you know, you've been structuring, this conference is structured around these three crises, right? Inclusion, sustainability, and structural transformation. And I, I sort of like the way Danny Roderick started last night by actually suggesting that the concept of development in crisis is an interesting one at the moment because in some sense, developing countries have been doing very well in the last decade and a half. So perhaps we should call them challenges rather than crisis. But whatever it may be, there's certainly a challenge of inclusion that faces uh, development. And I wanna talk a little bit about a particular aspect of that, which is this concept of inequality of opportunity. What I first want to do is say what it is, what, what inequality of opportunity is, and then I'm gonna to try to convince you that it is an important angle that we should bear in mind as we look at how developing countries are progressing and how they're addressing the issue of inclusion. So the question of sort of what inequality of opportunity is, in a sense comes from this broader question that people were thinking about you know, in the 70s and 80s, possibly they were thinking about that in ancient Greece as well, but the idea of what constitutes a just society? What is the right space in which people should look for equality? People like John Rawls, who wrote A Theory of Justice, Amartya Sen, and many others, at that time, wanted to move the sort of ethical underpinnings of social sciences and economics beyond just utilitarianism, which, as some of you may know, is associated with this idea of Jeremy Bentham's of the greatest good for the greatest number, right? So maximize the sum or maximize the average, which, as many people have noted, notably Amartya Sen, uh, is you know, supremely unconcerned with distribution of that average uh, in the space that it cares about, which is utilities. So they wanted to move to something that had the concept of equality in it, but equality of what, which happened to be the title of this lecture that uh, Sen gave at, uh, I think, uh, Stanford University in 1980. Equality of what? Do we want equality in final outcomes, like income or years of schooling? Probably not. And probably not because there's possibly an acceptable role for individual effort and responsibility. Some of the things that people achieve through effort and responsibility, may, it may be acceptable to have society reward those differentially. But there must be a prior space, they, these people thought, in which there is equality. So a number of people, and I won't dwell on the literature here, but a lot of people like Ronald Dworkin thought about, you know, is it equality of resources in some sense? Richard Arnson and Jerry Cohen talked about equality of opportunity. More recently, John Romer also talked about that. So the, the basically, you know, there's a lot of nuances and differences between what these people were thinking about. But the basic idea is that societies ought to be just if they provide equality, but not necessarily equality in final outcomes, perhaps equality in some prior space that gives people the chances and opportunities to then develop on those and achieve whatever they're looking for afterwards. And of course, the concept of inequality of opportunity or equality of opportunity is also one that has great political currency. I have one quotation here from FDR's inaugur second inaugural address, but you know, it goes much beyond the United States. Uh, the idea of equality of opportunity is appealing uh, to, in many countries and often across the political spectrum. Yeah? Now, can it go beyond just being an idea, a, a nice term? Uh, can, it, can it be something that has practical use for development economists, for development practitioners, for policymakers in developing countries? That would require that the concept be something we can formally define and that we can measure. It's hard enough to measure inequality in incomes, uh, or consumption. People have written you know, books and volumes of journals about do we measure it this way or that way? How do we get the data? Opportunity sounds like something even vaguer, right? Even sort of more abstract. How do we, how do we measure that? So I want to tell you briefly a little story about that. 
uh, about how uh, economists have in the last 20 years or so begun to think about ways of measuring an equality of opportunity. And the key idea goes back to these two people, one at the University of Ghent in Belgium, Dirk van der Gaar and John Romer at Yale, who thought, well, one way of looking at inequality of opportunity is to think of advantages, things we care about, like, I don't know, think of income, but you could think of educational achievement or health status, so, some advantage that people care about, and then think all the things that determine those, let's divide them into two groups, some which people can control, we'll call them efforts, and some which people cannot control, and we'll call them circumstances. So if in a country your race or your gender affects your outcomes, then that's a circumstance. You can't control those. Or your family background, or where you were born, or in global terms, the country where you were born. Other things you can control. Your own education is probably something that you can in part control. And of course, the theory allows for the fact that circumstances also affect efforts and so on and so forth. And you know, there are books about this, and I'm summarizing some stuff here uh, uh, in fairly in fairly simple terms, but the basic idea is these people said, well, we can look whether there is an equality or equality of opportunity in a society by looking at whether the advantage, let's just call it income, is distributed independently of circumstances or not. If it is independent of circumstances, there is equality of opportunity. Your race and gender and family background don't matter. Uh, and they noted that if that happened, you could look at it empirically in the following way. And this is what I'm going to say now is the only difficult part of the talk. There's an equation there. I was told not to put equations up because you guys don't like them. The, ignore the equation. The important thing is what I'm going to say now. And then everything else will follow very easily. The, the application of this concept is as follows. If there is equality of opportunity in a society, a large enough society, so then in statistical terms the law of large number applies, then if you divide that society into groups so that in each group people have the same circumstances. So think of men, women, black, white. Four groups, right? Black women, white women, black men, white men. The distribution of income across those groups should be the same if there is equality of opportunity. There may be inequality within the groups because some guy works harder or some lady works harder or whatever, but across the groups the distribution should be the same. That's what that equation says. So you see, it wasn't difficult. Now, uh, in reality, though, that doesn't happen. So here are a bunch of distributions of income. They're really consumption, but distributions of well-being in different countries. Now, let me explain this for a moment for those of you who are not used to these things. These are cumulative distribution functions. They give you the mass of people, you know, rank people from the poorest to the richest, and they tell you how many people are there with that much consumption. These are log consumptions, you know, log sort of deviations from the mean, so never mind what the unit is, it's just the poorest guy to the richest guy, okay? Now, instead of plotting one for Colombia, I've plotted three. Why three? The three corresponds to people whose mothers have different levels of education. Now, the way it works here is uh, these things, right, they give you the mass of people who have income up until that point, so you wanna be low. Low is good, low is better. There's more people that are rich if you're low, okay? A high one is poorer than a lower one. What are these? Well, these are people whose mothers have primary completed schooling or more, incomplete primary schooling or more, and uh, no schooling, okay? So what's the point? The point is that on the basis, if I sort people on the basis of something over which they have no control at all, which is their parents' education, I get a, a, a lot of difference in how much income or consumption they have, which is evidence, prima facie evidence, of uh, inequality of opportunity. And systematically, that's true in Colombia, Ecuador, Guatemala, Panama, Peru, all the countries that we've looked at. So, you know, that, that equation that I had here, what it would mean in practice is if I plotted these things in a society where there was equality of opportunity, those distributions would lie on top of each other and they don't lie on top of each other for consumption. But I don't need to look only at consumption, I can also look at more basic things like the probability of survival. Then you don't have a distribution, you have something like this. This comes from the WDR that, um, that was mentioned in, 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 in the introduction. This is uh, 
a whole bunch of countries and, and infant mortality rates, okay? And of course, they vary across countries. So, you know, in Mozambique, it's much higher than in Colombia. But more importantly, what we've done here is we've looked at two groups of people in the same country. So, for instance, take El Salvador. The average is about 75. This is old data, so now it would be much less than that. But it's about 75 per thousand uh, 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 infant mortality rate. So of a thousand babies born, 75 would die on average in El Salvador. But if your mother has no education, that is 100. That number is 100, so one in 10. Whereas if, your mother, if the mother has secondary or higher education, that's 25. Meaning to say that if you're born in the same country, in this case a small country, but in different families, <coughs> at the outset, you're less than one year old, your chances of survival are four times larger. That's, again, prima facie evidence of inequality of opportunity. And uh, I put there the crisis of inclusion heading because it, you know, it seems to me this is a sort of, it's almost, it's almost, I should have put scandal of exclusion because this is sort of prima facie evidence of a great deal of inequality uh, very early on in life. Or we could look at education enrollment profiles. So these are enrollment profiles in Turkey. Uh, what, what are these things? This is the proportion of girls and the proportion of boys that are enrolled in school at a given age, okay? So you see big drops around secondary schooling, right? And so these are girls and boys, but they are also divided by, again, the education of the mother. I just picked the education of the mother because it's an incredibly powerful predict predictor in each of these, these cases. And so here you've got the ones with high <coughs> education, the ones with sort of medium education, and, and, and the ones with no, mothers with no education, and I forget exactly what they are. But the point is not only that girls do worse than boys, but that the effect of family background, or the correlation with family background, is more pronounced for girls than for boys. So if you look, for instance, contrast here, you know, let's look at boys from highly educated parents, when they are in the high school transition years, 15 to 16, they are all in school. But the girls, particularly the girls from low educated parents at 15 and 16 in Turkey, about a third of them are in school. Two thirds have dropped out. So again, big gaps, okay? I should say that none of these things is evidence of a causal relationship between this particular variable and the outcome, obviously, because there are lots of other variables that are omitted in the analysis here. These are correlations, but they are prima facie evidence of inequality of opportunity. Inequality of opportunity, as defined by Romer and Van der Gaar, clearly does not hold in these domains and in these countries. Now, these are depictions and descriptions. Can we go beyond? If we wanted to look, for instance, at the impact of particular policies on inequality of opportunity, <coughs> or whether inequality of opportunity is related to economic growth or other aspects of development, we'd like to have more than these graphs and pictures. We'd like to have measures of these things. Can we go? beyond that. And it, people have been working a little bit on ways of measuring that along this, this definition. And there are two, two approaches uh, here. And I decided last night that to stay within the 15 and 20 minutes and avoid it being tackled by, by my chair, I should just focus on the one I'm going to use rather than two of them. And, and that's this ex ante approach, where the basic idea is to focus, is to sort of give a value to the opportunity set that each type faces. What's a type? Remember I said divide the group into four, black women, white women, black men, white men, so the circumstance homogenous groups, those are types. Types are the people in a society which share the same circumstances. There could be inequality within them, but there shouldn't be inequality between them if there was inequality of if there was equality of opportunity. So what some of us have done, I'll skip my beautiful graphs there. I, I love these graphs, but no time for them today. So, uh, so some more equations here. These are really easy equations as well. You'll love these. Uh, these are just saying, well, one way of measuring inequality of opportunity uh, is to say, instead of looking at inequality in income across everybody, let me give those four groups, think again, black men, white men, black women, white women. Let me give each of these people in each group, the mean of that group. And so I'm now looking at a distribution that has been smoothed, 
technical term, Foster and Schneerov, Journal of Economic Theory, 2000, smoothed distribution is a distribution where you've done that. You've given everybody the mean of the group. So you just calculate inequality in that distribution instead of the inequality in the full distribution. And that is a measure of inequality of opportunity that's fully consistent with the theory of ex ante inequality of opportunity. Or you could take the ratio of that thing to the inequality in the unsmoothed distribution. So it's really, really very, very simple. And then you can look at how that does in the world. And you know, a whole bunch of papers uh, have uh, looked at that in, in different uh, regions of the world. I want to show you two pictures that summarize some of that, uh, some of that evidence uh, across a whole bunch of countries. Now, ca caveat here. For, these come from four or five different papers, which are the ones there. And they are not exactly the same sets of circumstances, so they're not, you know, 100% comparable. But they are as close as we can. You know, my, my title in this talk was, uh, what do we know so far about inequality of opportunity around the world? And, and I, I think that's sort of where we are at the moment. Now, what's in this graph is the total height of the bar is inequality in income or consumption. The red part is inequality of opportunity measured in the way that I've just described as a share, you know, so at that level of the total. Now, when you look at this, there's one important thing that I have to say, and that is that these measures, they provide lower bounds for inequality of opportunity in the following sense. If I partition the group into black women, white <coughs> women, black men, and white men, I'm not using their family background. So I'm saying, that all of the inequality amongst <coughs> black women is due to effort. That's clearly not true. Some of it is due to the fact that they were born to parents with different levels of education or households with different level of wealth or different geographical areas or some went to daycares and others didn't and there may be elements of luck and there may be elements of measurement error and those things can make that red part there go up but never down. And in that sense, there's also some element of causality here now. So economists, as you know, some of you know, and others will in the future, worry a great deal about causality. And you know, I've said so far from those other graphs, you couldn't say anything about causality. Here you can say at least one thing. You can say that all of the circumstances together cause at least this much of the total inequality. You can't say those circumstances, because there are omitted circumstances and so on. But the total set of circumstances causes at least that much and could cause much more. I prefer to spend a little more time on this graph where the same information is presented differently. And here, what I have is the ratio. So this is the proportion of total income inequality due to inequality of opportunities. For blue, you've got that when the advantage concept is income or earnings, and for green, when it's household consumption. And they're ranked by the ratio. Okay? So this is an enormous variance. It goes from 2% in Denmark, I forget if it's 2 or 3%, but 2 or 3% in Denmark, to, in the case of Guatemala, for consumption, 50%. So that's an enormous uh, difference, which suggests that this concept can actually vary a great deal. You'll notice that you know, this is a selected sample. This is not all of the countries in the world. This is the countries for which this work has been done. But you'll notice that th there's kind of a non-overlap between rich countries all of which are here with low inequality of opportunity, and developing countries, all of which are here. And you know, there's big gaps between, say, India. Well, India's quite bad, but I don't know. Take Lithuania, I don't know. Is that a developing country? It's kind of borderline, but it's not so bad. But if you look at Brazil and Guatemala, it's really very bad. It's not surprising that it's systematically higher for consumption, because consumption is closer to the concept of permanent income. It's closer to this concept of a sort of average well-being over time. So there's less cyclical variation and measurement error uh, you know, that gets attributed to effort. So that means that when we get closer to a sort of better measure of lifetime achievement, an even greater share of it is due to things over which individuals have absolutely no control, like circumstances. So inequality of opportunity in that way. Now, uh, this can also be done. In a, in a slightly different way, to measures of educational achievement. So let me just show you a couple of graphs on that as well. So I've done so far inequality of opportunity for economic well-being measured by income or consumption. 
That's not the only achievement we, we care about. You can also care about education or health or various other things. You know, there are these um, test scores uh, uh, surveys done by, by PISA, the Program for International Student Assessment uh, at the OECD in a, in a large number of countries. We can look at the share of variation in that uh, distribution, in the distribution of test scores across countries. That's due to predetermined circumstances like gender, father's education, mother's education, father's occupation, all of these variables here which are also in the data set that PISA collects. And if you look at that, you know, it ranges for a whole range of countries between 10 and 35 percent, again, as a lower bound, okay? Um, and there are some correlations between that and various things. For instance, inequality of opportunity in educational achievement is negatively correlated to the share of public spending in primary education, which sort of makes sense. Inequality is positively correlated with the incidence of early tracking which is the share of um, uh, technical or professional enrollment in secondary education. Again, this is, these are not, not causal associations now, but they're just to say these measures aren't pure noise and they have some correlations with variables in the way that you'd expect. I want to slow down now for my last two slides. This one is actually from work by uh, two other people, Marrero and Rodriguez, who are Spaniards, Spaniard colleagues of ours. They said, you know, they went back to a literature on inequality and growth that some of you may be familiar with. That literature was a huge literature for a while in the 90s. Uh, Danny actually and, and his uh, uh, co-author Alberto Alessina wrote one of the first papers in it. And in those kinds of papers, they did this, this cross-sectional regressions of growth on lagged inequality. And when they did this on the cross-section, they found, you know, inequality was usually bad for subsequent growth. And there were different reasons why that might be. Then somebody came along, Christine Forbes in 2000, and said, well, you know, let's do a little bit better. Let's do a panel regression. So instead of one observation per country, they had a number, and, you know, it went away, sort of, you know, became positive, or we weren't sure, and all became very ambiguous, and we don't know. But these guys said, well, what if, what if inequality, actually other people, a number of us, asked the question, what if inequality is like cholesterol? What if there is a really bad type, but one that's not so bad? What if the inequality of opportunity is really bad, but the sort of reward to effort, you know, there may be something to it, at least as far as growth is concerned. And they said, well, let's separate the two using these measures that I've just shown you and see if the effect on growth changes. And they did this in this paper for the U.S. Uh, using the PSID data. So U.S. states over time. And, you know, there's another regression where they have just inequality here. And it's positive, negative, insignificant, does whatever, you know, usual Forbes result, no result. But when they separate total inequality and inequality of opportunity, so that that's kind of a residual up there. So they have, here, they have these kinds of measures, right? Then it becomes consistently negative and significant, suggesting that that's really, that's really uh, uh, you know, that inequality may actually be bad for growth, which resonates a lot with some of the theory, not so much the political economy kind of theory, but more the capital markets kind of theory uh, on that. So to conclude, my last slide, um, I wanted to try and argue that inequality of opportunity may be at least as important a concept to grapple with as inequality in income or education and so on and so forth. It matters ethically, matters because that's the sort of right space to be concerned about. It can be meaningfully measured, varies dramatically across countries, can be applied to education, but also educational achievement. It can be applied to health and, and, and certain things. And then two uh, closing points for, for this conference. It, it relates, interestingly, to some of the debate that's going on in the U.S. right now. You know, some of you may have seen uh, this thing about the Great Gatsby Curve. So Alan Kruger, who's um, President Obama's uh, chief economic advisor, talks about uh, the, the relationship between inequality and mobility. Uh, and, you know, that relationship, if there's less mobility where there's more inequality, is intermediated by, by inequality of opportunity. And the last point is, it doesn't exhaust the, the, the discussion, obviously, in this uh, forum. For instance, I gave a very similar talk in Egypt last uh, year, in December. And, you know, there, the kinds of inequalities that are behind the Arab Spring are probably not these. They are in a different space, which I'm sure my co-panelists will talk more about. So I'll leave it there. Thanks very much.